So I want to welcome you all to the massage therapy session tonight. <laughs> All right, a uh, couple words on networking, especially for uh, those of you to here tonight from the University of New Haven. Look around. Look around. You know how many people here might have a job for you? Know how many people here might lead you to your next opportunity? The number of different types of talents we have in this room tonight. An innovation expert, a coaching expert, a leadership expert, a um, couple of I.O. psych senior people, besides Lynn. Um, it's an awesome group for all of us. So think about who you meet tonight and how that network that you build over time will benefit you in terms of being better at what you do. I couldn't do any of what I do without this board of directors that I have. Um, you know, from programming to finance to social media to college relations, um, these folks work very hard on behalf of our membership here, and I am so grateful and so lucky to have them as part of this group. Membership. Don't want to spend a lot of time pitching this, but. Um, Membership does have its benefits. Joining the local chapter, I'm just talking about the financials. If you're a member, you pay a lot less for dinner at night when you come and visit. Um, on a national level, to become a so-called power member, both local and uh, national, you have the opportunity to tap into the vast array of programs and services and information that uh, National provides to those of you who are a member. So I certainly encourage um, uh, you to become a member. Do we have any new members here tonight, by the way? New member? Welcome. You want to stand up and introduce yourself real quick? Kurt Oster, uh, Human Resources Director and Staff Development Director at Cornell University Veterinary Specialist at Stanford. Cool. Welcome. Again, we're very grateful to those uh, companies and individuals who have uh, honored us with their sponsorship over the past year. Uh, again, uh, being a not-for-profit, not in the business of trying to make money, uh, these folks help us an awful lot. Uh, Sandra. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So we are going to announce that the community of practice that is you hear a lot from Denise and Karen about uh, is having a special event. And it is on May 3rd at the Westport Library, and you're welcome to come. And it's particularly focused on growing your business. And I see one of the panel, besides myself, I see Rich Cooper. Sorry, Rich. Um, so raise your hand, Rich. Yay. So we're going to have a great uh, event, and I'm really looking forward to it. So it's really for coaches that are looking to grow their business. We're going to talk about referrals and social media and cold calling and all the things, you know, all those questions that people might have about how to grow their business. So we're hoping that you can join. And there is a registration, and so we look forward to you register in advance and then join us at the Westport Library, which is coming up next week. And the cost is? The cost is, if you're a member, nothing. And I believe it's $10 for non-members. So uh, look forward to seeing you there. Want to say something about the resource table? Oh, absolutely. So we are so glad that you're here, and we want to get to know you better. One of the ways you can find out about this ATD group is our resource table. So take a look at what's happening, learn a little bit about power membership, 
learn, and you also might see some materials there from some of our members. So we'd love you to learn a little bit more about us. And also online, please join us. We have a LinkedIn group and we have a Facebook page. So that please like our stuff and join our group and engage with us because we want to engage with you. So thanks for coming. Thanks, um, a couple other things that I just wanted to make mention of. Please note on our website uh, something that we never had before. And I think I've mentioned it before, but I haven't mentioned it in a while. We have a capability uh, for those of you who are prolific writers uh, to post blogs uh, and have them published on our website. And I think they'll probably someday also link to LinkedIn and whatnot. I don't know that we've we set up that capability yet, but certainly you can post those blogs on our website. And we have some 300 odd people that are ad hoc, at least members of our chapter who may see what you've written and may find of interest that which you might have to share. Uh, we're also gonna be setting up a resource uh, center on the website, it's now invisible, but on that will be some of the slides that have been shared with us by our presenters uh, over the months, as well as links to uh, our YouTube channel that will be able to have people revisit uh, the actual presentations of those who uh, have presented in the past. So, next month, you want to talk about it for me? He's your guy. Uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Todd Church. Has anybody seen Todd before? Yeah, a couple of people here have seen him up at the leadership forum at Silver Bay at Lake George. Uh, Todd is a real interesting guy. He absolutely believes in the three E's. He will engage us, entertain us, and educate us. Uh, he's a real great guy. He had, his start was actually uh, working with some Hollywood folks. So he's got a little gift of that showbiz in him, but he's got a great message, particularly around visual leadership. He was the first guy that I saw do a complete PowerPoint presentation probably eight years ago with not one word in it. So he's expanded that. He's got a trademark, a couple of books coming out on visual leadership. We're in for a real treat to see Todd next week, or next month. Thank you, Steve. One more thing. Please fill out your evaluations or Michelle will not let you leave. Um, now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend Eric Eager tonight. Eric is somebody who I have had the privilege of knowing for about a year or so now, maybe two. Uh, he's a business leader, an executive with some 20 years of diverse organizational development, change leadership, uh, talent, performance management, and learning experience. Uh, during his career, he specialized in the area of peak performance, leadership, teamwork, executive development, change leadership, communication, strategic organizational development. There's a lot I could keep telling you, and you, you've probably seen the bio already, but ADP may have been the most fascinating company anybody could have gotten the opportunity to walk into. As ADP, this company that Wall Street darling makes money hand over fist year after year after year, uh, you can always count on a good stock price, was smart enough to recognize that there's these little things called startups that overnight might put them out of business, so how do we deal with that? That was the environment that Eric walked into, um, focusing on initially global talent uh, solutions and later on change leadership and change management uh, in running the center of, of excellence. You ran it, right? And um, so <clears throat> that's kind of a role that defines you at the end of the day. Uh, before that, Eric was at um, was head of the global professional services for the AMA, uh, did organizational development training for uh, McLadry, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. He's also co-founder of an organizational development network in Long Island, and has been frequently published and quoted in professional trade journals. journals. 
uh, has a doctorate in psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco and a BA from Adelphi. I want to introduce my friend Eric Hager. many I.O. students in the room, I think all of you have gotten quite familiar 
that if I give you a set of stats, you can figure out what story you want to tell. Well, we figured that out in business a really long time ago as well. So stats will only go so far. The question is, and I think what we're trained to do in a lot of our professional careers and even in school, is to be able to look at data sets and conclusions and question whether in fact the analyses applied should have resulted in the conclusions that were drawn. So a lot of that skill ends up translating into the business environment depending on how you see yourself in position and how you see yourself in relationship to whoever you define as your, well, let's say your client or customer or patient or whoever the end user is or end consumer is, what it is that you see yourself doing that's a value. And that's what we're going to dig into just a bit. And of course, um, to the extent that it's possible, we have an enormous amount of experience here in the room tonight. And this can be tough. And especially even for folks like me, it's, okay, well we have our expertise and we have our experience. It's only our experience. It's not everybody's experience. There's so much more to it than that. And I'd like to invite you to bring that and share that and use questions as well as you can in your table groups to listen even though the others at the table may look to you as the expert or the one who has the answers. So that was my intent tonight, was not to come with answers, it was to sort of drive more questions, and we'll see where that goes. Good? Make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, how many of you are familiar with Burson? Josh Burson and company, now Burson and Associates, owned by Deloitte? Uh, it looks like uh, not that many. Okay, for those of you, well, maybe half the room, for those of you who aren't, this is an organization you need to know. There's really two in our professional space across the spectrum, well, three that we tend to pay a lot of attention to. One is Burson and Associates, another one would be the Conference Board, and the third would be CEB, Conference uh, Corporate Executive Board. And now CEB is part of somebody else. They've all kind of joined and merged. They all have different aspects. What's important about Burson is that Burson is not a proper consulting firm, even though they've been acquired by Deloitte. Their primary job right now still is research. And a lot of what they do is they look at maturity models. Well, one thing that I'd like to put up just to get your reaction before we dig into things that are a bit more provocative is to show you what's been said. This hasn't really changed in a few years. They did a bunch of benchmark research to identify what are the levels of maturity that we see across large-scale learning organizations. Before we get into this, I'd really like to see some hands and get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you are internal to companies? Just the handful. Okay. And how many of you are providers, consultants, coaches? Okay, and if not one of the previous two, um, <laughs> what are you and identify yourself? <laughs> Academics. Oh. Yep. But you okay. can always ask the question, past tense as well, right? So that's kind of yeah. career inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I would imagine, how many of the consultants that we have in the room, coaches, consultants, trainers, etc., how many of you came from corporate or had in and out exposure as well? All right, perfect. Now, assuming that you do have clients, what I'm going to ask you to do through the rest of our time together is to use the reference point of either a client or some anchor of an organization that you identify with. And that's how we're going to dig into the material quite a bit. So the first is to take a look at this maturity model. I'd like you, if you can't read this, you may want to get to a place, I think everybody you can see this, yeah? Okay. So the concept of a maturity model is what is the level of sophistication and evolution that an organization goes through to make itself, quote unquote, high impact or more effective over time. And what Person did was identify four levels. This is about as scientific as we're going to get tonight. This is what I'd like you to look at. We'll get into a little, more, little bit more detail. It starts at the bottom as level one. And you'll see, as you read these, they become increasingly more complex and more sophisticated. Let me get out of your way. Take a moment to absorb this because our first table related activity is going to be revolving around this material. All 
right? Even if you don't absorb it all, we'll get to it in a little bit more detail. So let me show you what level one looks like. I don't need to read you the bullets so you can make this out. I know it might be a little bit small given the size from the back. Level one we'd consider to be more reactive, more tactical, fairly uh, low level, not necessarily integrated, and lots of training based activity. Okay? Here's what I'd like you to think about is think about your example, whether it's an organization you came from, an organization that's currently your client, or the organization that you're with. I want you to try to put a pin or a marker in place around where you think that organization tracks to. Okay? Here's what level two looks like. This is where we go from scattered training and development activities to something that we would consider to be more of a form of excellence. This means more sophisticated, more under control, more organized, more significant governance, and repeatability where the quality bar is pretty high. Okay? Make sense? And then what you see at the bottom is interesting because even this particular maturity model built two, three years ago, uh, this is an interesting note on e-learning. E-learning now feels old. Yeah? <laughs> Delivery type. Delivery type would be method. So that could be virtual, it could be in person, it could be large group, it could be small group, it could be portable device, it could be any number of things. Yeah. So it's a combination of, of venue and how content is moved. And that's also assuming that content is king. Okay, that's a very important point. Now, when we get to level three, we talk about a different level of performance improvement and really thinking about um, where talent planning and development planning and overall leadership are integrated in a higher order. This is often considered to be the standard of most fortune companies today, is where typically large companies want to be. Level four tends to be identified as more aspirational. So does this make sense? There's a particular phrase in here that should get your attention, which is learning culture. And in the top, you see the focus is on talent and organizational performance. What that really implies strongly, and this is an important takeaway, is that it goes beyond the typical, um, let's call it ROI type measurement, and the looking at the various types of results, the level of results that we tend to use to think of as the gold standard for L&D, and thinks about this in a very different way, around what is the true impact to the business, what is the contribution, what is the value. That's different than measuring the activity and then measuring the exact one-to-one -one result of that activity. Organizations that are still doing that are not here. That's level two which is to say, not particularly mature. Here's the first time I get to throw stones. Okay, this makes a lot of people very upset because you go back to the Kirkpatrick model and you look at all the levels of quote unquote training impact or learning outcomes and we get into very open conversations around how learning, quote unquote learning, is measured. That's not a current modern day conversation if you really think about the point of it all. And that's what I'm going to challenge you to talk about in your tables in a moment. Here's level four, which you do see is largely aspirational. I don't know exactly how hopeful that is, though, with person. This is according to their global benchmark. They tend to be pretty sharp. What you see, most importantly, learning is owned by the business. What that implies is that learning is not owned by HR. And that causes a lot of us to scratch our head. Go, well, what would that look like? What does that really mean? So if you have a large, let's call it a large distributed business, say for example the business that I came from, we had a highly federated model. So what that means is you have a fairly small corporate center and it's not like a hub and spoke. It's more like the businesses and the units around are truly the drivers of almost everything and the center is organized exclusively to serve the units, not the other way around. And there's often a power struggle around who is the master and who is not. 
Okay, so in these cases, the question is, is where does learning not only emanate from, who is it exclusively designed to serve, and from what vantage point? In a traditional corporate environment, you have that coming out of HR or formal global talent or a learning organization. That sometimes works and sometimes not. What we tend to see the trend toward is that the corporate center will own things like compliance training and things that have to be done in a compliance driven way across the whole enterprise, though what each individual business unit or function needs tends to be locally contained within the unit. That leads to all kinds of other challenges in terms of sharing or not sharing, and intellectual property that ends up being repeated over and over and very um, inefficient leverage, inefficient spend. It's not necessarily right or wrong, it's just a series of consequences. All right, does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, here's where we're gonna shift now. And I know some of you are still eating, we'll work through it. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of you are learning folks, you may have heard of this before. The three R's approach to work stands for you may want to jot this down. This is a way we tend to look at facilitation exercises as well. The first R is reflect. And that means to think about. Individually think about, quietly absorb. The next thing that we're going to talk about with the R's is record. Take a moment to write some things down. Same thing. For yourself, quietly, it's not a team sport yet. The last piece is respond. That is where we begin to dialogue. So this way of approaching work is a way to allow us some space to get into our own thoughts, get some things down, and not get overwhelmed by how much noise ends up happening in the conversation right away, and then we're off to the races. Okay, so if we apply this to the questions that we have at hand, I think you may get a little bit more value out of it. So, reflect, record, respond. Now, <coughs> Here are the first set of things to think about. Do these questions make sense in light of what we were asking? Okay. So I'd like you to take a few minutes um, and process this with your table. Okay? We'll take a few minutes. If we don't need 10 minutes, we'll cut it back a little bit and we'll go from there. So, what's the first thing that we should hear with this idea of reflect? Silence. It's exactly it. Take a couple of minutes. Take a couple of minutes. Resist the urge to just immediately get into dialogue. Take a moment to think about it. Get yourself grounded and be prepared to share as well as to listen and see what you come up with. And then I'll check back in with you in a few minutes. Good? I'll probably put around as well. Yeah, right, right. 
the 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 Never had an organization at the fourth level. At the fourth level, the top level, I've never had that. I think most organizations are between two and three. Because what we really do is between two and three, they're not very long, they're too long, and they're just going to really stay long. Yeah, so it's all about teaching, and sort of getting them to. You get so far, and then the regime changes. Like something, or you know, in real life, something happens. Something happens. And then all of a sudden, it's working out again. It's interesting to see that. I work for practically the other side. And they're right now, I think they're probably going to have to be the country because they're sort of shifting from that traditional box here. They're shifting towards the meeting to more of like a free core, kind of smaller, more conversation that's built on growth and development. So they're going to be making that change in a lot of people, unfortunately, and all these different Oh, it's kind of interesting what he was saying. So, yeah, I like your point about that. I don't, I've never been a part of anything that's in that before. Well, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
we've been around a long time, we're very successful, but we are definitely stuck in a run. Two, two lines. And I'm surprised what you said, so I kind of agree with that. Two lines are really, really not. What's your competition? Well, we are second in our goal. So we are fairly successful. We're not moving. We're not moving. So we're kind of stagnating. So, like you said, we kind of do the new one. But what we need to get people in the door and start working as far as forward thinking, there's very little. And, and my reasoning, my thinking of why we're in this rut is we have very little. From the executive level. So it's hard to be innovative. When your company has a year to achieve these that have gone past. And I've been thinking about that a lot over the past one or two thinking of leaving because I'm trying to do more things and so, you know, training is passing us by. We're stuck in this of doing things the whole way. Well, I don't know Everybody, if I can ask you to take maybe one more minute, or can we, can we come back to the center? Well, yeah. All right, let's see if we can bring everybody back. That was quick. That was close. What stood out? I'm curious for just a, a couple of examples. Is there anything that any of you heard from anyone else at the table that really stood out to you? Particularly in answer to one of these questions about if yes, what's changing? How is the organization maturing or how is it changing specifically? Or if not, why not? I'm curious about those two dynamics. What's changing and what may be an obstacle or in the way? What did you hear that grabbed your attention? Or that made for a really good story or surprised you or whatever the case. We don't want to hear the boring ones, just the good ones. What did you hear? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. So I'm going to speak on what I heard about Mr. Oster um, and where he works, which is the Cornell University Veterinary Specialist. Um, he very confidently said that they're at a level two and that they're striving for a level three. And what struck me was the conviction at which he said it. It sounds like they will make level three, if not very soon, shortly after. Um, talking about the leadership and the support. Um, so I think that there just was so much positivity in how we got it. I'll serve as the mic runner too. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else willing to share? Yeah, thank you. We noticed a tremendous amount of level one still going on in organizations simply because of the need for compliance. And that if there was anything going on at level two, it may be uh, disconnected and unfocused so that it's not going to re uh, result in the kinds of things that we would like to see happen. Anybody else? They do a lot of talking to each other. Where are they? 
<laughs> so let me just thank you for that. So you're on to something really important there, which is it really begs the question, when you look at these kinds of levels, how they apply and do they apply in what we might consider to be the next evolution of work, the way the workplace is changing. So from that perspective, I think it's a really, it's a really important question. The presumption for a lot of this research are really large global companies. And still, we have to ask the difficult question of, even for large global companies, how much of this is actually helpful? So we're going to dig into that just a bit more. All right, from here, here's where we're going to go to you next. I'm curious for you to have this conversation. Okay, for some of you, you've had this conversation many times. Some of you probably have a, a you know a fully printed soapbox to stand on exactly with this topic. I am curious because when we start to use terminology that we think moves across space, it doesn't. It tends to mean very different things to different people in different organizations at different times. So if you would have this conversation. Are training, learning, and development really all the same? Are they interrelated? Are they different? If they're different, how? And then the question is, is do you want one? Do you want them all? Do you need them all? Is there a priority? Because as an internal leader, and especially one responsible for any degree of budget and or allocation of resources, this becomes a very important question to answer. Because the way that other people see it and have preconceived notions about what you're supposed to deliver, what you choose to do with all your available resources may change quite dramatically, depending on other people's perceptions, not just ours. So, I'm curious. Take a couple minutes to have this conversation. I'm going to bring you back in less than five minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
or an LD professional? Name the client. Who is Me? your customer? The client is the organization. <laughs> is it? Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, well that's what I'm asking. What is, is what, what I'm curious about the perspective. Or you're being individual. <laughs> Well, actually, you may have different customers. One customer is the organization that brings you in to help with whatever issues there are. Another customer is the learner or the group of learners, the participants themselves. No, yes, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Keep, keep going. What, what are their thoughts? I'm curious if anybody thinks differently. So keep going. I think the core customer you're looking at is the person who's bringing you in. And that is likely the business, so the training or the learning that you're doing, you want strategically aligned to what they're looking for. The product is the people in your classroom or the people that you're empowering with training. So they're not your customer. Your customer is that business and strategically aligning with it. Okay, so now we're looking sort of one step through. Yep, keep going. I think to say that the uh customer is the organization is too nebulous. At the end of the day, it's going to be who's paying you yeah. and who has the authority over you. So when you say who's paying you in an organizational setting, who would that be? It depends upon the project. So in a sense, it's probably going to be the person who has authority over you. There are probably some projects, and I'm looking at it from an internal perspective. Uh, there are probably some projects where my direct boss would be my customer if the project is coming from him or her. Now, there may be other stakeholders in that project who are feeding in through him, him or her. But depending upon how direct that relationship is with the other internal customers, they may be nothing more than stakeholders. Uh, if it's a pro an, organiza uh, an organizational project, then it, it may be the front office that's the, uh, that's the customer. But it has to be someone who either is paying or has the authority. Um, so, I want to pass this to whoever's next because I want to see if there's still yet a different thought, please. And just before you do, bear with me one second. The, the term stakeholders, is that familiar to everybody? Yeah. Okay, also, if I were to ask you, which is later in the list, who are your stakeholders, that's another really sticky mess too. Um, because a lot of us will define that very differently and some will be very narrow, some will be very broad. Overall, though, everybody's heard the term, including our students. It's familiar. Okay, I just want to be sure that we're not using jargon that isn't really understandable. Okay, please. Hello, so I'm going to um, bring this back to an academic standpoint. And I'm in an organizational effectiveness course, and right now we're learning about open systems. So I feel like the customer, ultimately, yes, it's the individual who's paying you, but at the same time, you have to understand the whole entire open system. So the organization itself, who the employees are, and who are the um, stakeholders, in a sense, because if you don't know that entire open system, regardless of your customer, you're not going to be able to provide them with that actual need that they need in order to survive and thrive. So that's what I would say. Good. All right, very good. All right, we're still, we're still expanding. Oh, there are teachers in the room. Right? We, we are still expanding. Anybody have a different thought? I'm fighting this the whole way. My question is, why didn't you say who are your customers? Uh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Any other thought? And then I'll, I'll address it. <laughs> because there is, there's, there's very much something to talk about there. Um, I think this is very interesting. I just, you know, personally, I would like to take the word who is paying out of the yeah. equation, because if you're doing pro bono work, you still have customers. So I think of it more as who's, who is the beneficiary of the work I'm going to be providing yes. as a training professional. Let alone pay, you know, I know we all need to put food on the table, we all work for pay, but to me that's got nothing to do, to do with the customer. It's who is impacted the most by your work and your, your um, your initiatives. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Good point. All right. So let me let me bring this back for a moment to the conversation. Whether we use this as a singular or a plural, or a plural and we attach it to money or not, this is a very difficult question to answer. 
And if you talk to most traditional learning leaders inside an organization, whether it's a for-profit or not-for-profit, we usually get into an argument, more of a philosophical, and then it becomes a practical argument around who exactly is the recipient, who am I here to serve, or who are we serving? The problem with that is that we end up often with a major disconnect, which is why L&D and HR get slammed so hard repeatedly, and end up in a place of being more about compliance and provision of content rather than business enablement. We need to talk about this. <coughs> this idea, and we've used the jargon for a long time of internal customers, and typically in corporate functions, we've adopted that kind of language. That we, whether we're HR, legal, finance, IT, security, whatever the function is, is that we have internal customers, internal clients. I'll tell you that at least my perspective, there absolutely is no such thing. It's a total fallacy. There is no such thing as an internal customer, internal client. If we look at the world that way, we end up segmenting and end up fracturing our attention. The question around who are we serving ultimately is who is the reason or what is the reason that the entire system is organized around. So how are we affecting the entire value chain from wherever the value is created back to the center? If we, are, if we see ourselves as learning providers and we take requests and we fill requests, all we do is reinforce the stereotype. So in the kinds of positions that I've been responsible for and the way that I see things, this becomes a really critical question. Because if I were operating with a full P&L and had responsibility for a client set or a service recipient set in a nonprofit setting, you as quote unquote a learner in the organization just become a vehicle to get a very different and more significant set of results that lead to continued organizational health and success for why we're organized to exist. Does that make sense? This is very difficult to answer because if we get distracted by things like smile sheets and immediate feedback and wanting to make the people who sit in front of us happy as if we're serving their needs, they are not the end consumer or customer or client or service recipient. They're just a byway. They're only a vehicle. So the question is, how do you get beyond that to what are they supposed to do or change or impact differently that will get a different result for the organization in the end that serves the larger purpose of what we're trying to achieve? The only thing that I would say to that is, if the people who are the primary customer, the organization itself and its top leaders, are still buying in to making people happy on smile sheets, then you've got a cash point too. Yeah, then you have a problem. <laughs> then you have a big problem. Because then you, you fundamentally labeled the entire provision as non-strategic or disconnected. And the question then becomes, is that enough? For folks like us, is that enough? Is that what you want? Is that where you see yourself maturing to and developing to as a strategic business partner or leader in your own right? I think it's an important question to ask. I saw it, Ham. Yeah. And you can continuously to characterize things like that as just make things more and more ambiguous yes. in the way, and it's just going to be pulling rabbits out of the hat at the end of the day. You're not going to get at it. Yep. So, yep. Go, go one more, and then let me show you the rest. No, we'll let you grab it. Oh, then we'll come back to you. Oh, there you go. It's back already. Basically, you say uh, money talks. So, so again, it may not. Yes, though it may not. Much as was said, it may not be about money. It's a question of what effect are you trying to have on the environment that you interact with. And that can have very local results. It can have very far-reaching results. The question is, is where is your focal point? If your focal point are the people right in front of you and the people that you're sort of chemically interacting with, we have an extremely short-sighted view. So when you do pull out to more of a system look, we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit, and we'll go deeper into the challenge. Again, how do we frame ourselves, our work, 
our delivery, and how we end up contracting internally, externally, or otherwise around what is the point, what is the service provision, and how do we expect success to be measured, defined, and fed back. Not in the way that we used to think about measuring learning. It's about measuring the system effect and measuring the impact and the consequences of putting people in environments that allow them to see things differently, make different decisions, and thereby get different outcomes. That is a completely different conversation to have, which takes us away from this notion of training into a place of being able to set conditions in which learning and development become possible. <clears throat> so this is about a very different type of shaping, and that's what we're going to get into some specifics about. All right, so let me show you what the rest of these look like. You don't have to scramble to write these down. We'll send these to you afterwards. Though I would challenge you that the next time you think about whether it's contracting on a given piece of work, whether it's internal to your organization, external because you're paid as a consultant, whatever the case, is to run down this list. There are a couple of things here that become very challenging to answer. So take a look at it. <coughs> So this will give you some insight into where my head goes. So when I'm thinking about designing, or I'm thinking about how to use myself as an instrument in the work, I need to be very clear about where I have pitfalls and where I have opportunities. And when there's lack of clarity, what that tells you immediately is that there's lack of alignment around the absolute specificity of your purpose and the application of that purpose. You have that, you have a fundamental weakness in everything that you deliver. That doesn't serve us well as leaders, as professionals. So if your work is easy enough that you have an order sheet and you're there just to deliver a quote unquote a training session, fine, that's simple enough. If you're being asked to take people on a learning journey that will lead to a type of development that advances the organization's ability to produce results, we have to ask much more difficult questions and be a lot more demanding of where are these answers coming from. And sometimes things that may look very similar to you. So for example, who is your customer? Very often in a corporate setting, the first thing that you get as an answer to that is, well, it's the sponsors. Whoever your sponsor is or sponsors are, meaning the people who are technically paying for either your time or providing you access to do what you do, or actually moving resources to make that possible. That's very short-sighted. <clears throat> Not to be overly judgmental. It's just, it's, it is very short-sighted. Okay, so, that gets us only so far. And if your job is to make people happy, and to deliver something that people want, rather than potentially maybe what they need, or what plays a different long game, that may very much be your bread and butter and your core business and your core competency, there's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't the whole picture. Yeah, so you start getting into yeah. what I was just going to say. Sometimes training simply needs to be tactical. Yes. There's nothing more than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's certainly a place. The question is, as a quote unquote learning and development leader, we're now talking about going beyond training and KSA, standard knowledge, skill, and ability kind of stuff, and looking at ability squared. And now we're talking about exponents on impact. So when you look at this particular list, your stakeholders now in today's world all of a sudden become very different. So if we use the lens of leadership development for just a moment, let's go back to even my AP examples. When we look at leadership development, leadership development needs to be far more about the individual leaders. It's about a cumulative impact and effect of raising up an entire internal population to create a cultural front that affects meaningfully the way that the business does business. So we don't focus on the content. And that's what I'm going to share with you as we go a little bit forward is, well, if it's not about content, what is it about? Well, there's a whole other world beyond the content. So here, when we say who are your stakeholders, the other thing that's really important is that in a company like ADP or anything like it, 
your stakeholders are not the people who are included in the room, included in the event. Your true stakeholders are everybody they touch. So when you design and you think about the impact of this, you think about all of their downlines, their teams, their organizations, their client sets, their natural professional communities, their industry affiliations, all of a sudden, if your head doesn't explode, you have to start thinking more broadly around what are we trying to enhance in their ability to do on behalf of serving clients. And if we talk about endlessly in most big organizations now, this sort of new, quote unquote, new revolution of client centricity, that goes back to who is the client? From an L&D or even a training perspective, who is the customer, who is the client? If you can't challenge the question with the people, if you're not doing native design and somebody comes to you with a need from inside the organization, if you can't have these kinds of very difficult and provocative conversations, then you're not upping the game. And I think most of you know this. It's just a question of how difficult is that to do, especially when you're face to face with somebody who feels extraordinarily clear about what they want. There is an upside and a downside to fulfilling all those requests. So we run into that and every other organization runs into that. You talk to people like um, not only Josh Person and that crew, you talk to all of the member companies and they will tell you that if we were to serve every request that we had, we would end up building these Goliath internal learning organizations or we'll outsource it all. Either which way it becomes hugely expensive massively time consuming, and now we run into a secondary constraint of nobody wants to spend the time or the money. This sounds like a circular death spiral. This is not a good, it's not a good story to tell. So the question is, how do we change the storyline? How do we change the nature of the dialogue when we go through the contracting? So I'd like you to consider that as you go forward, take yourself and your whether you call them clients, customers, whatever the case, through these series of conversations and see if you can get yourself clear, okay? Now, as we go forward, um, what I'd like to argue on some sense is that the point of all learning and development activities or experiences is to create change. Yeah, would you yes. agree? Oh, yes. I mean, fundamentally, that's the point. Even if people acquire new knowledge and there's a transfer of information, the point is, is to drive some type of change. Yeah? Okay, yes. fairly simple. Part of the problem that we often have is that people don't like to be really uncomfortable. And we understand that change itself often gets associated with this. We know that change is disruptive. And we know that change itself, any kind of fundamental learning, requires also a degree of unlearning in many cases. This causes a destabilization. There are a lot of people who are not interested in that. That is not what they want. So they came, whether it's to be entertained or educated, it's a more passive experience. You take people to a different level of taking them to their edge or just, just beyond their edge, and people are not gonna be happy, and your smile sheets are not gonna look great. Okay, so the question is, where is the trade-off, and in what time frame? So instead of this equation, uh, let's think about reframing the equation. I'd like to posit, and you saw this in the description, that we, that we think about this as really this kind of equation. And this is not even really the whole story. When we say change equals learning equals growth, what we're really saying is that change creates the opportunity for learning. And learning creates the opportunity for growth. It's not a necessary outcome. And one will begin to lead to the next, to the next, to the next. If this becomes the basic assumption of why we do what we do as professionals, and we have buy-in from the customers or the clients, that this is the equation that we're following, the fundamental idea or the philosophy behind it, we can start to have a different conversation around how do we create the conditions for this to happen? rather than the content that we drive to make this possible. Okay, if this is an easier graphic for you, you might visualize it this way. Either which way, the construct will hold. Does this make sense? Okay, as we go forward then, we understand 
that change also, by definition, has to mean these things. Well, very often this is not what the original request is for. I think a lot of you have experienced this. That's where a lot of the chuckling is coming from. This is not what people signed up for. So we end up in a quandary. Do we do what people expect? Or our quote unquote internal clients and customers are even paying external clients, whatever it is, do we do what they expect? Or do we provide them with something with a different level of value and do we raise the game? What is next level integration? Next level integration is when you give people an opportunity to not just absorb new content, it's when they reorganize the way they think and take in information to reframe what they experience. So therefore, they go back, for example, to the same team dynamic that they came from, or the same kind of structure of work, and all of a sudden, things look and feel different to them. Yeah. So like when you teach someone a coaching model. Yes. And so instead of banging their head against the wall with that same person, yep. suddenly they use the model yep. and it's a dialogue. <coughs> uh, yep. Then. yep. And, and it begins with recognizing, literally seeing differently, right? Experiencing differently. Yeah, exactly. And many you were wrong. Could be. And having the ability to know that you were wrong about something, so you can learn something new about it. It could be. Or, or it could just be enough, what we call frame shifting, that it hard shifts your perspective, that you see something from a totally different angle and it gives you a different look. <coughs> exactly, just like that. Okay, now, where do we go from here? Um, this is, again, not to go into real standards, though it's very important. When we talk about in business, let's talk about business strictly for now. When we think about why we create change, we create the conditions for change specifically to drive results. That is not often the conversation within training, learning, or development departments. It just isn't. The kinds of results that we've been traditionally focused on look different than this. Here, there are three big metrics in all of business. Have any of you heard of something called the Iron Triangle? Is that familiar to you? Okay, the Iron Triangle and the theory of triple constraints. Big language, big words. These are very common in project management and in ways of assessing sort of hard business metrics. It's very fancy language to say there are three major metrics in all of business and business economics. That is cost, quality, and speed. Everything that you can measure and or look at in terms of business health and performance will fit into one of those categories. Cost is an aspect. So in general, what we tend to look at is, well, in theory, most businesses would prefer that revenue usually goes up, quality usually gets better, and speed usually increases, and cost goes down. This is not a universal. It's just a for argument's sake. There are a lot of times where you actually want to see revenue or quality go down for all kinds of other reasons. Without getting into that, when we think about architecture of quote unquote learning and development or even major training initiatives, we want to understand the consequences of how this affects these three metrics. What is the effect we want to see on the business and how will we know working backward from the client the true client, the outside client, and the business results is what we're doing impactful. So, this becomes another big question, is that if you have a client, whether you're a consultant, internal or external, what is it that they're trying to achieve, specifically? If it's just transfer of information, or it's new knowledge, or basic sort of skill building, then yes, training is the answer. If what they want is to see specifically different either innovation or disruptive change or major um, changes in interaction and the way that the business functions and operates. Then we need to have a different conversation. And that's where we start driving to, well, in 6, 12 months, how would we all sit around this table and not have an argument about whether everything we did was successful or not? So from a change leadership perspective, this is the ultimate question, is let's get settled on success definitions and metrics and measures today that we can come back in six, 12 months, theoretically in the same configuration, sit around the table and not have an argument about whether what we did was successful or not. 
if there's nothing else I leave you with tonight, that should be it, is get incredibly clear on what success would look like. Other than that, you'll have all kinds of opinions all the time about whether what you did was actually effective or not. Okay? Now, from here, um, here's the next series of provocative questions. Okay, we have a little bit of time, what, 10 minutes? We're good? Okay. So, let me just pose this. Um, this is another thing that some people might, I don't know, this might rub you the wrong way. Um, the concept of this, look at the equation, that little symbol over there is greater than or equal to. Okay, these types of things are probably what most of us have been referred to at some point. Hopefully not just metrics reporters or God forbid event planners. Like, you know, if that's what you do for a profession, that's fine. But that's not how most of us like to be referred to as. Though I'll tell you that in really big corporate settings, that's what a lot of us do. Especially with million dollar budgets and major, major events to run. These are big, complex events, and it's not to downplay the importance of event management. You need a very strong team to get this stuff done smoothly and get it done right, especially when you have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of constituents running concurrently all around the world at the same time. It's very complex. So it's not to downplay the place that all these roles have. It's a question of where do you see yourself as a strategic leader and somebody who really makes a difference in driving change. And what are the activities that are going to be high value, or what are the things that can be easily delegated and or outsourced? And this becomes the real scary part about this, is what is the real value? What ends up happening is that, how many, I don't know, how many of you have worried at some point that your function and whatever it is that you do is becoming increasingly commoditized or you're, you're really subject to be sort of easily replaced or outsourced. Can I see hands? I mean, how many of you have thought about this? How many of us have experienced it? Yeah. Did you hear that? How many of us have experienced it? Okay. This is an ongoing issue. And it's not to say that there's a right or a wrong here. It's a question again of what is your discrete value? And where is the value proposition? If your work is seen as commodity-based and commodity-driven, you'll be replaced or continually evaluated on the basis of quality and cost and speed in ways that are not strategic to the business. They are purely cost um, or resource intensive. And can we do it better, faster, cheaper? That's the impulse in capitalist-based business. That's how it works. It's not a value judgment per se. Yeah, in terms of a personal value judgment, it's a sort of objective value judgment. That's a problem. So how do we change this? I think that was... So how do we make ourselves less outsource, uh, uh, let's call it at risk? Well, I'd like you to consider something a bit different. Look at the terms. So when I think about how we began to internally brand ourselves at ADP. And I think about how we started to take up our roles. We never really talked about learning and development. It just wasn't part of the language. We just changed the language. And interestingly enough, when you redefine and reframe the language, you reframe the perceptions of it. If you can back it up with meaningful conversations at a peer-to-peer -peer leader level to really drive very specific activities and outcomes. And all of a sudden, you get known as something else, rather than, oh, the training folks are here. Okay, That's a start. Where do we go from there? One of the most important things on here, other than um, business solution architects, is we kind of reframed ourselves as change leaders. That was our job. Our job was to fundamentally create the conditions to drive change. We didn't talk about training. We didn't talk about learning. We didn't talk about endless amounts of workshops. We didn't frame it that way. So I'll get a little bit clearer on this in a moment. The other thing about this piece, about nodes and connectors, let me give you a really, really clear real world example. We used to run leadership development, um, I don't know what you want to call them, 
They were kind of like giant cohort groups of people that would come together from all over the world and on a periodic basis would come together to have exposure to all kinds of things. So these internal quote unquote learning and development events were really based on leadership development. One thing that I noticed immediately was a binder would get put together with the bio of every participant who was coming. Because the defined customer in that case was the internal executive who was to participate. So we used to ha hand out, quite literally, a binder available to everybody, digital beforehand and then in paper when they got there, with everybody else's bio. Except for the people who put the whole event together. Okay, wait a minute. So, what message does that send about who's important in this scenario? Well, it turns out that the people who are primarily designing and supporting the event, which would be some of your very, very senior HR folks, your talent partners who are kind of like um, the people who deal with talent succession planning, who are scouting around the business, and even the event coordinators, it turns out that all those people had immediate access to everybody. And the people that we put in that roles were hyper connectors. People who served as amazing sort of concierges of the experience. And what was really interesting was that what most of these leaders came to these events for was not for the content, it was for the experience of getting to be with each other and build their internal network. The content got in the way of the experience. And the traditional learning folks could not get over it. All they wanted to do was drive content because their value proposition was attached to what they were delivering in terms of material and content, whereas the participants, their equation was just get us all together. So what was also interesting is that when they wanted to find each other and when they needed to source internal references or even soundboards, guess who they would go to? They would go directly to the nodes and connectors. Those would even be your admin assistants who made it a point to email and call every person who was on that entire leadership roster. So regardless of their level in the organization, their impact on the business was immense. And it had nothing to do with formal training, learning, and development. It had everything to do with how you take up your role in crafting an environment. Does this make sense? And they were very often forgotten. That was a uh, that was a problem, all right? So being mindful of time. Let me share with you just a couple of other things. Um, most of you have heard this. Bless you. You've heard this kind of thing before, right? Okay, how many of you believe this is true? That's a setup question. Okay, so yes, it's true to some extent. The, there's a problem with this. There's a platinum rule. And this platinum rule absolutely applies in the world that we need to be operating in. And speaking of not turning yourself into a commodity or being easily outsourced and take your role as a strategic partner, this is far more important. Does this make sense? Okay. So, of course it doesn't make sense. <laughs> This becomes the question is, is not only it's not only who knows you, what do they know you for? How do you build a brand and a reputation inside the business? If you're respected as a business leader who happens to have a specific expertise in these kinds of areas, your value is perceived as very differently than a call in to the HR or the training department or the learning department. Okay? So this is a model that I created a number of years ago, and I talked to you in the beginning about looking through lenses. And I'd like you to write this down, and we'll send this to you afterwards. This is one way to look at the world and shape things up. Context, culture, and climate. Context answers the basic question of, kind of when we do, I came out of a lot of years of consulting, the best way to start a consulting engagement is drop into a room, and all you need to ask is, what's going on around here? <laughs> That's how it all starts. It's not any more sophisticated than that. And context is about not only what's happening today, what has happened in the past, and what do we anticipate is going to happen in the future. There's a time and space element. Culture is beliefs, behaviors, values, and assumptions, typically slow to change. 
And climate is like mood and attitude. It can shift on a moment's notice. When we're thinking about specific, let's call them interventions, how do we be the intervention in a specific business process? These are the three most critical efforts um, or lenses to look through as change leaders. Good? All right, we can dig much more into that at another time. If you want to talk about this at any point, you're welcome to engage with me. I'm open to any of these conversations. As I was rethinking the role of what learning and development really needed to look like, this is it. This is what we fundamentally do. So I would go back every time and say, is this what we are living up to? What we're being asked to do versus what we're creating and what we're delivering as part of the business, an integrated part of business process, are we living up to this? And this was the bar that I wanted to say. If you set the bar that's in between, mm -hmm. it's in between right, each day, so if you set this bar. If you set the bar? If you're the individual who set this bar. I'm talking about collectively. Collectively, okay, sorry. Yeah. This is, this, is really, this is really a mindset that changes the way that we think about what it is that we create and how we interact and how we drive value. And again, I'm happy to share this with you later. Um, and we don't need to really talk about that. So coming pretty much to the close, let me get past this. Here's the other thing that I'd like you to just run your eyes um, down. <laughs> this is the last point of really being provocative. This is what we tended to see beforehand. And this is what we're used to <clears throat> hearing about. Let me just bring that up. These things look familiar to you as core to things like traditional L&D. Make sense? When we talk about teams, what we're really talking about is team-based. Very often we do things for intact teams, meaning a given business leader calls and says, here's the request, and we want to do this thing for the team. This is, again, this concept of looking at organizing our resources is beginning to deteriorate, mostly because intact teams are beginning to deteriorate. Now what we're seeing is constant reformation of groups of people in self-directed or project-based work that may be very complex blends of internal employees and external contractors. That's the way that work is getting done. The whole situation of who we serve and who our customers are once again gets turned on its head. It's not as clear as it was. So this is the way that it used to be. This point um, is another really painful one for those of us that are used to designing quote unquote learning events where your internal clients basically go, really? I know you told me it's going to be three days. Can't you do it in a day and a half? <laughs> okay, well, if you say yes, uh, you know what, a day and a half can't, well, that means we can bring it to a day, can't we? And just call it, you know, wrap a bow around it. Like, this is an endless conversation. If that's how we think, if that's how we think, then, we, then, yeah, it's like, let's, let's go down to the smallest possible part, right? And now, and now all we've been talking about is quote unquote micro learning. Okay, this is, this is commoditization at its worst, okay? Now, there is a place for it. It is not the strategy. It may be a piece of the strategy. The question is, how much time and money do you really want to invest in that when you have finite resources? I would argue, not a whole lot. Because the consumption rate, when you look at the actual metrics and the hard data, the consumption rate is horrendous. People will look for stuff when they need it, not just because it's there. It's not entertainment for them. It's not like pulling up, you know, streaming Netflix. People are not going to go to your LMS to go pull on-demand content the way they're going to watch games, games of Thrones. It just does not work like that. Okay, and the data shows it. So, what might tomorrow look like? The very first thing is change the language. Remember what I said before, the language is the basis of all culture. And you want to redesign culture and redesign impact, you change the terminology. So the first thing is, don't call them trainings. Figure out how to get away from the word training if it's not training. If it is training, call it training. If it's not, call it something else. And figure out what your core customers want 
what they expect, and who are the people that you need to interface with to create that effect. So what, what we used to talk about, for example, the way that these leadership development events turned out to be, and what people valued the most, we would bring these leaders together from all over the place, and rather than driving very specific content, or God forbid, yet another model to introduce something again that they've had four other models for, don't give them any more models. Give them exposure to the most senior leaders and the board members who can shed new insights and layers into how the business really works, and give them access that they didn't have. So when we call them conferences or summits, um, it changes the feel for what I'm supposed to do as a participant. And it definitely gets them out of the perspective of, I'm just going to sit here and listen, and maybe if there's something interesting, or even worse, I'll go back to the frame that if I get like two or three good ideas, it was worth my time. That's a horrendous way to measure the impact of what we do. We need to shoot a little higher than that. So there's the first thing. The second thing, as opposed to teams, we're now focused on communities. Organizing change fronts and learning communities are a completely different concept than focused on team-based learning. Communities are how do you bring people of like mind and interest together to get a sort of a, uh, an overall rise or a lift in the impact of what you're trying to do and how do you find ways to expand your impact. I remember saying to you, clearly we're getting away from content. This is what we're going to, is experiences. If you follow any of the business and trade journals, the constant conversation now is around the client experience. Well, client experience work is nothing new. The question is, what is the flip side of the coin? The flip side of the coin is the employee or associate experience, or the people who are there to provide the client experience. There needs to be as intense a focus on the user experience on all sides. So now, when we talk about creating things that look like vehicles for learning and development or training or anything of the sort, we want to be experienced designers, not content providers. It's a very different way of thinking about architecture and design. Okay? This goes back to very much your great point from earlier, which is system focused, not individually focused. The concept of leadership development is changing. The idea that leadership development is about one person at a time and that a leader is an individual person is also a complete fallacy. So when we think about leadership development, we think about it as a systemic cultural lift. We think about it and then organize our, our way of interacting very differently. And instead of focus on an individual and character and values and behavior of one individual, we focus on peer and interacting systems. It's a much more sophisticated way to think about how you design. That bridges to the same thing about interdependent, and then most important, learning embedded in the work. This is about where we're going to end. The idea of quote unquote learning and getting away from content driven to experience driven. Here's a really good example. How many of you are familiar with TK? TQM from years ago, and then into Six Sigma, and then Lean, and then Lean Six Sigma, and now sort of self-organizing systems. Is that familiar? Okay, Lean Six Sigma itself is a work process that is fundamentally a learning event every step of the way, and has nothing to do typically with formal content. The training aspects of Lean Six Sigma are like that big. The rest of it is in vitro, in flight. So our job is to serve as guides and a concierge for the experience and to help create the frame in which learning can happen. And therefore, learning is embedded in the work process, organized around a very specific set of outcomes and results that have nothing to do with the learning provided. It has to do with the learning experience created. Make sense? Okay. Okay, and then... This, um, we don't need to spend much time on. These are just a lot of the key areas that still we're talking about in terms of the, the vanguard of where we've not really kind of gotten to one standard yet about things like business acumen and critical strategic thinking. All these things are super important, 
and there are some providers and some internal organizations that have done some really great jobs. The reason that word failure is up there is that creativity and innovation often have nothing to do with one another. Sometimes innovation has sort of no input on the creative side, and innovation is the result of incessant hard work and lots of things not working until something finally does. And a lot of Lean, lean Six Sigma is like that. We wouldn't often call that a creative process. What it is is a grinding process. So when we look at these things, um, these are just things for you to consider in terms of the still very hot topics and the high consumables. What internal buyers and corporations are still looking for and talking about are things that will address these. Okay, so just a cheat sheet for you. Um, really brings us to close. So with the point that I wanted to make from the very beginning, just to bring us back, is as you think about yourself and your professional identity and your role, I would strongly encourage you and hope that the conversation that we had this evening allows you to look in the mirror a little bit differently and start to rethink whether you need to rebrand and reposition how you show up in the work that you do. Thank you. Another hand. That was incredible. Wasn't it? Um, let me just please note, I, I mean this sincerely. Um, even though the tone was really heavy, I'm not usually, usually um, I'm a lot lighter than this. This is an important topic, I think, for our field. And I, and I feel really strongly about the future of the profession. And I care a lot about it. And I care a lot about how we project an image out to the world that we touch. And I think where our capabilities are, are in fact oftentimes a lot bigger than the titles we're given. So if any of you at all are interested in picking up this conversation or whether you just want to talk about different things or just soundboard or bounce ideas with me, I'm absolutely happy to, to engage with any of you. Um, this is just my personal contact info. In the next few weeks, I expect to have kind of a big announcement of where my next big landing spot is going to be. I'm, right. I've been internal, I've been moving between positions, and I'm going to another big internal position. I just, I'm not clear to announce that yet. So in the meantime, you'll easily be able to find me, and I will be responsive. It may take me a little time. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, engage me in conversation. Anything I can do to help, I'm happy to do so. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Um, while you all are, please do your evaluations. Um, while you're doing that, we'll do a drawing. I need anyone who want to put their cards in for the drawings for a free meeting. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, one announcement that I meant to make mention of at the beginning of the session. Uh, please anticipate coming up will be our annual uh, survey of things that you care about the most, things we're doing right, things we're not doing right, things you'd like to see come out of the programs and other uh, types of services that the chapter might provide. Uh, we do this every year. Uh, you should be seeing that come out. May-ish, early June. So just a heads up on that. And that does it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mark starts? Anybody else? Last call.